Welcome to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life from a bird's eye view on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. It's Shaw here. And thank you so much for joining me. And if you're new here, I do hope that you stick around. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Lori Singer to the show. Lori is a licensed psychotherapist and a board certified behavioral therapist. And she has her team who uses integrated behavioral and cognitive therapy strategies to help people who are facing a wide variety of mental health issues. And she's also the author of the book, You're Not Crazy, Living with Anxiety, Obsessions and Fetishes. And this book brings readers into the therapy room to help them serve as their own therapists as such. And we're always, she and I are both advocates for helping people to help themselves. Lori's also a decorated endurance athlete. So she just returned actually from Camino de Santiago and she did a 500 mile trek there, a hike which she talks about in the interview, fascinating stuff. And she has used physical endurance to help her mentally. And I think we should all find things that help us. And sometimes movement, physicality, you know, even dance movement can help us to somehow regulate and become more settled. And somehow that physicality can help you mentally. And I believe that this is why people find running so helpful, hiking, yoga, all of those things whereby movement is engaged. And it really does, you know, it's always mind, body, and body entails the movement and spirit. She was inducted into the Ventura County Sports Hall of Fame, and she's completed more than 100 marathons and ultra marathons and Ironman marathons along with many long distance cycling events. And and over the past year, she's completed a cross country bicycling trip and she rode hundreds of miles through Cuba. And she's about to do another one in Mount Kilimanjaro. She's about to do a climbing trail in Mount Kilimanjaro. And that is going to be fascinating. I think when you're a therapist, you have got to practice what you preach. And Lori is certainly an example of that. She uses her physicality and she uses that kind of strength endurance to help motivate her and keep her, you know, keep her feeling good. And everyone needs to find something to do. And for some people, it just may be art. And for some people, it may be keep fit or Zumba or whatever you choose to do. It can even be yoga. Lori is a trained and licensed psychotherapist and she's done the work. She's done the hours. She's put in her training. And I do ask her about that because it's very important to know it does take work to be a therapist. And Lori has been in several magazines. She's been in Forbes and she talked about online therapy for ADHD which she's going to talk about a bit more about. Um, She has ADHD as well, which she tells us in the interview. And she also gives people questions to ask a therapist when they start. And I think that's really important. Never go in blind. You know, this is your therapy. This is your recovery. Have an idea of what you're looking for. What do you want? And you can discuss it with your therapist to find out what's realistic, what's possible. Now, sometimes the results exceed your expectations, which is always the goal. She deals with issues such as anger management, tantrums with children, adults can have tantrums as well, Uh, anxiety disorder, OCD, phobias, uh, managing yourself as well. And that's the goal, isn't it? We are agents of our own. We need to learn to agent ourselves, to self-regulate ourselves, to protect ourselves, and to manage ourselves. And I think it's really important to look at self-awareness. How self-aware are you? 
And we do talk about that. And Lori, being a behavioral therapist or, you know, CBT, she's, it's within the realm of behavioral therapy um, and behave, the behavioral sciences. And CBT does focus on your thoughts, your actions, and the consequences or the results of those thoughts. Um, those thoughts can be unconscious as well. And as you know, in the UK, the NHS has propelled CBT forward as the go-to therapy. Now, it helps for some things, and I don't think it helps for others. I believe it can help with certain issues, like anxiety, like depression, but there's only so much that CBT can do in that area. But it's very effective for many things. And sometimes that is just enough to help you become aware, become self-aware of your thoughts, to bring them out, to work with a therapist, to learn to do the work because CBT requires, you know, lots of self uh, assessment. You've got to be aware of yourself. I would suggest to anyone to take at least one course of CBT sessions. It will help you to become more self aware. As many people are walking about around behaving pretty badly and they're just unaware of the effects that it may have on other people. And children, children can often do that. If a parent is not present enough, the parent won't reflect back to the children. You shouldn't do that, you shouldn't say that, that's not very good, that's not nice, that's not smart, that's unacceptable. You have got to literally parent your child, that you're responsible for that. And people often say, well, the school's responsible. And I don't agree with that. I believe that the parent, the child does end up spending a lot more time in school than they do with their parent. And if you're in boarding school, that's a whole different story, which um, which we're going to talk about hopefully soon with someone. But parents have a lot of pressure on them. They're the provider, they're the teacher, they're mold, literally molding a human being. And Lori works with a lot of families and it's important to work with the child and the parents. The child can change their behavior, but if the parents continue as they are, then how long will the change last? So that's why Lori and her team, because there's a team of people she works with, many people involved in the process. She's going to tell us all about it. But that's why it's important she she works with everyone. So it, it's been a fascinating interview. Really, really enjoy this one. Lori, thank you so much for being on the show. So here's the interview. Lori, thank you so much for being with me today. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm really interested in your work. Um, let's start with your training to be a psychotherapist, because if, if people have listened to any of my shows, they know that sometimes I can get a little bit of a bee in my bonnet about some people calling themselves doctors, complementary therapists, wearing the white coat. There's a lot of that going on in the world. I would like you to tell our listeners and viewers what was your path to become a psychotherapist? Well, actually, um, it didn't happen till later in life um, because I had a family. And um, then I'm sure you're probably aware that I had a son that passed away of cancer. And so that kind of prompted me. I wanted to help families. Once I saw the suffering that the families were going through, I thought to myself, how can I help these families? And the only way to really help was to go back to school and get an education. But it was very frightening to me because I was a horrible student and I didn't know why at the time I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD or a learning disability until I was in my 50s. And so and by that time I had already accomplished a lot as far as school goes. But I was very involved in, in the running community. And um, the local coach at the junior college had asked me to run for his cross country team. And at the time I had two small children. And then when my son passed away, I thought, well, I might as well give it a try, go back to school. And um, I applied the same skills to studying as I did for running and training for races. So I was starting to use tools that I still give to my clients today, and that's organizational tools. 
And uh, that's always a part of my plan. So I did that. And I had to start with like baby math and baby English because I was so I barely graduated high school. And uh, then I ended up doing very well. And actually, of the junior college, I graduated uh, uh, valedictorian, which was amazing for me. What an accomplishment, because I like I said, I had to move to a different state just to graduate high school. So there the training began as far as my education. And I had some great mentors along the way. And um, I it was interesting because I wanted to help families, yet I had never gone through therapy myself. And I came from a very traumatic childhood without realizing it because we all, especially as kids, I think we normalize our situation. And so we don't think of it as horrific, but as an outsider looking in, it is it is traumatic and horrific. So when I was in uh, graduate school, well, so let's back up. So I got my bachelor's degree. And um, from there, I started working with individuals with developmental disabilities, which I never imagined myself doing. And I loved it. I because it was so rewarding. You know, it's so rewarding when you're helping these families uh, reach little milestones of just compliance or hygiene or toilet training. You know, you get called in for a 10 year old who isn't toilet trained. It makes a huge difference in their life and making them feel better. So I thought, okay, this is my niche. This is my niche. And um, I thought, you know, I'd like to just go off on my own and do this on my own. So I went to graduate school. And while in graduate school for uh, for psychotherapy, marriage family therapy, they had offered, if you go to counseling yourself, meaning the students, you it, for 10 hours of counseling, you get 100 hours towards your 3000 hours for clinical, right, to get your license. And I thought, oh, I'll do that. Sign me up for that. So I, it was the first time I was ever in counseling. And this has already been so many years after my son's passing and my, you know, my horrific childhood. My mom was an alcoholic and drug addict until the day she died. So um, you can imagine what our house was like. And um, when I went to therapy, I explained this to the therapist. I'm sitting across from her and kind of just going through my life as if it was a shopping list like with no emotion and just as matter of fact. And she looked at me and she said, Lori, you've suffered a lot of trauma. And I said, really? And then she pointed it out. Well, from that day when I left her office, I started having panic attacks for the first time because I realized, oh, she's right. This wasn't normal. And this was really, a child should never have to go through this. And a parent should never have to watch their child suffer and die of cancer. So... I continued with my education. I was able to develop skills for anxiety to help me because after that point, I couldn't drive on the freeway because of my panic attack. So she gave me some breathing exercises, but for me, that wasn't enough. So I kind of developed my own uh, visual aids because I knew that worked for individuals with developmental disabilities. So I came up with my own idea and implemented that with myself. And now today I still use that with my clients. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now back to the show. Well, that's incredible. There's so <laughs> much in that. Um, <laughs> firstly, though, I am so sorry for your loss. Thank you. And you're right. There's something very unnatural about even the thought of a child leaving the earth before the parent. Um, so without any therapy, I, I don't know how you how you got through that. And and at that time, they didn't really have therapy for parents. You know, you go back. I mean, this we will be uh, this will be 39 years that he passed away. He had passed away just, I think it was 12 days after his second birthday. And um, they really didn't have anything. And in fact, the hospital rooms were actually wards. So here you are with your child and you're with like five other parents in a ward. 
And they don't want you to spend the night because I don't know why at that time, it's just the way the hospital was. So as parents, we would hide in the bathrooms and then the nurses would change their shift. And then we would sneak back out again just to be with our child, you know, so they wouldn't have to be alone in these crib cages that they kept them in at the time. So it was things have changed dramatically. And I could see that, you know, our daughter at the time was five and um, we felt bad for her because we were kind of neglecting her, but we had a very tight family. I was so fortunate. My dad raised us because my mom left when I was 10 and my husband's family was very close. So everybody pulled together and my daughter would come to the hospital and had nothing to do there. So there was nothing really for the kids in the hospital and there was nothing for my daughter to do. And after my son's passing, I had read the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, which is an amazing book. And in that book, it says, do something to memorialize your child every year, if possible. And so we did. We had a fun run in his name and donated the money to Children's Hospital in L.A. to buy toys for the kids. Well, after 10 years, they contacted us because we had been doing it for 10 years in a row. And they said, hey, we're getting these checks every year, you know, with your son's name on it. We'd like to approach you about possibly starting a child life program. And I thought I was getting the call because I was going to be in trouble for using their logo on the back of the shirt. But um, we got that all straightened out. And uh, so that's how the child life program came to be about. So now the the siblings and the children are are getting therapy for themselves that's helping them. So it's how times have changed. So no, we did, we had no help. It's up for family. Thank goodness. You know, thank goodness for family or I, that's, and that's really what prompted me because I saw when kids came to the hospital, how it ripped families apart. They started blaming each other and it was just, it was awful. Yes. We hear it all the time that a, a child's passing can cause divorces at high rate of family yes. and all of that and yeah it's a phenomenon but um yeah what a loss but you it, obviously that inspired you in a way to move forward in your career career change your career but I do want to ask before I I don't want it to get lost sure you physically active at that time I know you we're going to talk about your you you do so much but you <laughs> you run as well you do marathons and all we're going to come to that but were you doing that already yes well I started to I was a tomboy when I was younger because I had my older brother and if I wanted to keep up with him and play in the neighborhood with the kids then I had to keep up so he really helped foster that um, athletic side of me and my dad would always play tennis and he would take us to the park and he would you know hit balls with us but then after my my eldest was born, my neighbor said, hey, let's let's run to the corner of 7-Eleven. And this was I was 22 when I had my first child. And I said, well, I'm not a runner. And when we got back from that short run, I thought, this is it. I love this. And I just never stopped. When my son was in the hospital, um, I didn't stop either. I brought my jump rope with me and I would take breaks out on the patio and where other parents were out there smoking cigarettes and, you know, just getting a breath of fresh air or whatever it was away from that situation of uh, the hospital, I would be out there jumping rope and talking to the parents. And that really helped me a lot. Mm. Yes, that's what I'm getting to. I wonder if that physicality or that physical exercise was a way to process or to keep you stable somehow. Um, oh, it, it definitely was. It's helped me through a lot of things. I mean, as far as, you know, my mother's addiction, I mean, it's obvious that I'm probably addicted to adventure and, um, you know, physical activity, but I think that's better than she was addicted to drugs and alcohol. Right. But that that's so interesting, though, how our bodies can hold. Um, I'm not saying that's what's happened to you, but I believe, and we do see people that come to therapy where their bodies hold a lot of that emotion and they're able to com compartmentalize. Uh, I suppose they put aside things and process it through the physicality. 
And we see that in boxers a lot, um, where they boxers can get out their aggression. And most of them have had really difficult childhoods. Well, I, yeah, I had, I had no idea. Really, I had no idea because I was so used to, like you said, shoving it aside and putting it in a place where I didn't have to feel because, and I think I was able to do that, which is not a healthy <laughs> coping mechanism, but that's all I knew. Um, I was used to it because when my you know mom would come home drunk and we would hide underneath the beds because we were so scared, my brother and sister and I, because of the screaming and her fighting and it was just awful. So we learned at a young age how how to take care of ourselves. And that's the way that we did it. And so I just did the same thing when my son passed away until I went to therapy. And it's still, the communication is so key. And this is, as you know, to anything, but if we don't talk about it, and I tell my clients that it's okay if you're not ready to work on it, but it's going to come out later in life. When you're not expecting it, something will trigger it. And then you'll have to deal with it. So you want to, do you want to try and get the skills now or you want to wait? It's up to you. Absolutely. All of that. <laughs> Absolutely right. Which brings me to uh, when, when we train, I think we're drawn to different areas of, of therapy. And you seem to have been drawn to CBT, cognitive behavior or behavioral therapy, let's say, um, overall. So can you tell us a bit about that, how it works? So why do you think you were drawn to the behavioral sciences or behavioral therapy? Well, I think, so initially when I first started, when I um, got my bachelor's degree and started working with individuals with disability, it was strictly behavioral. It was behavior modification, but it was actually before they had um, applied behavioral analysis. You hear board certified behavioral analysis. So it was before that. So back in the day when I got my bachelor's, um, it, I was focusing on behavioral therapy, Skinner's theories of behavioral therapy. And I saw that it worked. If you change the environment and you have visual cues, you know, to, as reminders, then it can prompt you to remember to engage in a new behavior. You have to teach a new behavior and, and you know, and change your environment. But once I started to go to therapy myself, getting my master's, I realized that, well, the cognitive part of it plays a big role because it's our thoughts that create the emotions and the emotions are exhibited through our behavior. So what I did once I went off on my own and I started combining the cognitive behavioral and the behavioral therapy together. And I think it's a great combination. So I got my license. And at that time, you could practice behavioral therapy. Then after a few years, they said, well, you need to have a, you need to become board certified in applied behavioral analysis in the state of California to practice behavioral therapy. So I thought, oh, now I have to go back to school again. <laughs> when is this going to end? But so after all those years, as you know, you know, in California, I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but we need to get 3000 clinical hours. So you have, you know, you go get your bachelor's for four years and you get your master's for two years. And then you take three years to collect your 3000 clinical hours. And then you have another year of studying for your exams and so I became a licensed psychotherapist. And at that time, I was using behavioral and cognitive. And then the state said, no, you need to do this. So I had to go back to school again. And I think it was just a year uh, of another uh, graduate program and then another year for studying and taking the exam. But I do believe that these the two combinations are so important because changing your thoughts, your thoughts are so powerful. And if you can learn how to stop and make a choice to remember that you're in control and change that thought and then have visual reminders around your environment uh, reminding you to stop that, that negative thought when it starts. I think it's a win-win because we're looking for information. I tell them it's kind of like we're detectives and we're trying to figure out when did you have that first thought? What were you thinking? What physical symptoms? Was your heart beating fast? Um, where you couldn't breathe, what was happening with you physically, and what were you thinking? 
and then write the antecedent. What happened just before that thought? What happened just before? So they take data for a week. And then the C part is what is the consequence? Did you, were you going to go out for a cup of coffee, but then you were afraid because you might get hit by a car um, or you didn't want to face, you were afraid to talk and see somebody socially. What was the consequence? Did you stay home? Did somebody else get the cup of coffee for you? Your, did your spouse, did your sibling? So we look for patterns and then family members, I have them fill out their own data sheet. So what did you notice first? What was happening? What were you doing just before the behavior occurred? And what did you do as a consequence? Well, I went out and got the coffee for my husband because I felt so bad. He really likes coffee in the morning and he was having such a hard time. He said he was very anxious. So now we know this person's enabling the behavior. And so they each have to have their own separate um, behavioral plan or you know, implementation of some type of strategies, they each have to have their own. Yes, that's so powerful for families and parents in particular as well, which brings me to the fact that you've got, you, you actually have a, a a team of therapists. So tell us a bit about your practice and, and how that works. Well, it was interesting when I um, first started, uh, again, when I got my bachelor's, I uh, was working for a company that provided behavioral services. And at that time, it was much different as well, because things, <laughs> things change, you know, the criteria changes, the laws change. And um, so I was primarily my, the owner of the company, my boss lived far away, and we really never saw him maybe once or twice a year. Um, and so I was left to kind of create the behavioral plans and, um, and, and, you know, just meet the client, write the plan, implement the plan. And then when I went off on my own, because I had made a name for myself in this county, people kept asking for me. And so I thought, okay, I guess I'll contract with the county because they were begging me to come. And I did that. And then I just kept getting all these referrals. So I thought, well, I'll see if anybody else wants to work with me. And it started out with just uh, somebody had a coworker I had worked with and my eldest daughter, Jackie, at the time, she had just gotten her bachelor's and um, it started out very small, everything. But then we kept getting all these referrals. <laughs> and so I thought, OK, I have to make a decision. You know, I want to help people. I'm so fortunate that I get to have a career where I am passionate about because I don't think many people have that opportunity. And I feel very, very fortunate to do that. And um, as I said, the laws change and things change. And so we created where, much like other behavioral companies, that we have supervisors that are either board certified in applied behavioral analysis or they're licensed psychotherapists. Um, or like myself, I have two, you know, a license and the board certification. And these supervisors go in and they meet the families, they write the treatment plans. And then we have what's called an interventionist that works under the supervisor and they are trained and they go through a lot of training and uh, they have to have a four-year college degree. And they're the ones that implement the plan. They implement the behavioral plan. And when I say behavior, as I said before, it's a combination of cognitive behavioral and behavioral therapy. So they implement the strategies, they teach the client, they work with the families. The supervisor is still an intricate role because they come in once or twice a month to meet with everybody to make sure that things are going well. And we go in the home. So we either go in the home or the client can come to the office either way, because you get a much different picture when you see the environment and how it's contributing to the existing problem behavior. And we also go out into the community so we can watch how they interact. We can go on the job site to see if is that where they're having a problem. And so it's, it's really fun. <laughs> Nine Peaches Therapy self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by helping you to achieve confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. Created by an expert practitioner to help you to achieve the best result. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day using the most gentle and effective 
guided meditations to rid yourself of anxiety, stress, fear, and negative thinking. Available now on Spotify, Apple Music, and other platforms. Now that's interesting because when you said that, I thought about the lockdown. And suddenly Uh, we were all on Zoom uh, doing, I guess, was that the case for you as well? Well, so I, at that time, I was thinking, oh my gosh, some of our clients will not be able to do Zoom because they were, because of their functioning level and, or that they already have anxiety from being, not being able to interact. And it, it it got much worse even. So um, right away, I was contacting families from the get go and we would still meet if they wanted to. We would meet them out in the backyard. We would always wear masks. We'd meet in the backyard or we'd meet at a park if they felt comfortable doing that. Uh, So we would try because the individuals, we have, you know, neurotypical clients as well. And we would do the same thing if that's what they wanted to do. But they have a better chance of interacting with others. So when you have an adult with a developmental disability, all they have is their day program or their part-time job. And then they have us coming in. So when you take that away from them, they don't always understand. And it was just devastating to this population. And so our interaction was very important. And so we did both. We did the Zoom if they could, um, but we'd like to still do the interaction face-to-face. Somehow we worked it out. Incredible. Because I found it difficult. I like to see people I want to see. Yes what they're doing and then some people were just wanted phone calls so that was interesting as well that was something that we had to talk yeah I don't you know I I had a one client even recently and she just wanted to do a phone call and I said you know I really need to see your body language and you know she lives in a different state so I understand but so we started doing um because we had different phones she didn't have an iPhone so she said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do a video. And I said, well, what about WhatsApp? And so we created, we were able to do the video because it really is important to see their nonverbal. Hugely important. I agree. But I, yeah, it was a whole new set of um, challenges for me, I suppose. And for them. It was. Yes, for everybody. And, you know, it's so in California, I'm not sure. I know the UK was very strict, but then we had to keep files on my, my employees, which I felt very uncomfortable about. You know, did they get vaccinated? When was the last? And all of the, and I felt very uncomfortable doing that. But, but because the state mandated it, it was something I had to do. I think in California or maybe the United States, I'm not really sure, but legally you are not supposed to call yourself a therapist. You could get in trouble by the board if somebody finds out. What you can call yourself is um, a coach or a specialist. You can use the word specialist and coach, but you are not supposed to use therapist because you're supposed to have your license number after your whatever credentials that you have. It's different here. People call themselves all sorts. Really? Of things. That's interesting. I always tell people to look for qualifications, look for their licensing, look for... Yes. Them. Here in the UK, it's about membership as well. Are you Because to be a member of a particular supervisory body, they will check your credentials. And that's the only way you can become a member. So here, you, you've really got to check. What misconceptions do you... Thing people may have about therapy? Well, I think some people, which I'm sure you've experienced as well, once you get started and they're looking at themselves, they're not ready to do the work. They want you to have a magic wand and say, now you're better. But it takes work and it takes self-reflection to admit that this Once you have the information, especially the data, because I have them taking data, we can look at it. We analyze it together. You can see where the problem is. You can see what you need to change, but some aren't willing to change. They don't want to change. And that's okay. You're not ready yet, but this is how it's going to continue. And I tell people, you know, you're at a point in your life, you came to me because you're stuck. You can't move forward with your life. 
you're stuck. There's a path that you want to take, but something's blocking it. We can work together and find out how to get you on the right path, but you have to do the work. I can't do it for you. Absolutely. Yeah, and that magic wand is it's the proverbial magic wand. It's yeah, make me better, make me feel better. Uh surely you'll have the answers in this 50 minute session. You'll, yeah. solve, you'll solve 50 years in 50 minutes. That's yeah. <laughs> and 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 that's another thing too, I point out to my um, you know, the, the clients that come in is how long have you been engaging in this behavior? It's not that, you know, like you said, well, I've been smoking for 50 years and now I want to stop. Well, you know, it's going to, it's not impossible, but it's going to be harder. If you would have come in when you had only been smoking for five years or 10 years, it might have been easier. But now that you've had this habit for so long, we need to find a replacement behavior. We need to, you know, really work on this. And is that something that you're willing to do? Well, we don't know until they actually go through it, but you're right. Engaging in a behavior longer will definitely take longer to, you know, to improve that behavior or get rid of it. Or we'll get rid of it. Exactly. So it's interesting. You have to be in a space where you see the behavior as you explain. This behavior is going to cause you this. This is what is happening. Not could happen in this case. This is what is happening right now. Right. At this present time, you're about to lose a leg. Um, what might help is you stop smoking. And they say, you know what? No, I think I'll continue. So there's nothing anyone can do. I can't make him do, you know, I'm not um, a dominatrix. <laughs> I can't say you're going <laughs> to. And I mentioned that because I know you do a lot of work with fetishes as well. So, yeah. and, that's, and it's funny because that's what was reminding me of people that have inappropriate sexual behavior and you can you know what's going to happen it's like the guy who's going to get his leg amputated i think they don't believe you like it's not going to happen to me well the doctor says i might lose my legs but you know or my leg yeah, that's okay but when it comes down to it they don't want to lose their leg they're they're they just don't think it's really going to happen to them or or they're you know delusional and irrational about their thoughts. Their thoughts aren't, aren't rational. And it is like the person that comes in with the fetish where I say, I can see where this is going and you will end up getting arrested is what's going to happen. And they don't believe me. And I said, I, I visited some of my clients in jail before, so I know it's going to happen. And then when it does happen, where they get kicked out of school or they, you know, files are pressed against them, I don't say I told you so. It's more like, now what do you want to do? You know, where do you go from here? And sometimes, you know, sometimes they want to fix it and sometimes they're still on that path and there's nothing you can do. Exactly. Unfortunately. Exactly. Well, you want to make sure that the other people are safe around them and, and that's really all you can do. That's the huge part. Absolutely. Let's talk about social media and, and children and the impact. And I know this is a big topic, but I know we can sum it up a bit. But it is concerning that especially tic, uh, places like TikTok and things like that, where whereby I don't believe it's policed as they say it is. Um, so um, what what's the impact social media is having on children's mental health at the moment? Well, I think a lot of it that I noticed really started with the pandemic because the kids and teenagers and I mean kids you know younger kids and teenagers spent so much time because they were isolated and they couldn't get out socially to interact that they spent so much time on their phone taking selfies and just putting up things and and the selfies I you see it today people will stand there and take like 50 pictures of themselves to get the right angle and the right lighting um, but then I had quite a few clients that came in with um, body dysmorphic disorder. And what they would do is because they took these selfies and they would post them and they would get negative comments on certain things. And they take those negative comments true to heart. They're not capable of distinguishing like adults are to, to say, oh, well, that person was who cares what they think. So they really take it to heart. And then they are so obsessed with certain body parts that they want perfection, which no, we all know there is no such thing as perfection. 
And, um, and then it creates the anxiety and depression. So it's a horrible, and that's not even talking about like, you know, uh, posting whatever is the best group, or this is just about them personally and how it's affected them. So I did see a lot of that and I still see it today. I don't think it's as much. I think now people want to be able to get themselves on there doing something, you know, that's what it's more about. It's not so much them like it was before it just it seems like it's changed into something else since the pandemic i don't know if you've noticed that yeah definitely absolutely the amount of content the nature of the content but children in particular are still quite i suppose susceptible to influence and a lot of hate can happen a lot of influence a lot of coercive behavior um Things like grooming, I, I hesitate to even say some of these words because of you places like YouTube, but, yeah. uh, I, you know, grooming, all that stuff. So children don't know sometimes what they're looking at and opening and they can so, be quite disturbed. So, so where is the parent who is uh, monitoring this behavior and how old is your child and do they need all of those devices on their phone. What I tell parents is get a prepaid flip phone. I don't know why your child has to have the internet. I don't know why they need to have access to all of this. They're not an adult. I, you know, I know they want to be like their peers because that's important, but at, at what cost and why aren't, you know, a parent, you can get parent controls on just about any device that you have. So as a parent, you need to take responsibility. And that's the first thing I say is, why do they have a phone like this? Um, if you're going to allow them that, then you need to take responsibility and have the parent controls on there. And if you can't do that, um, then just get a flip phone, get a paid flip phone. Yes, exactly. There are ways to step in and to help to support your children. Absolutely. I'd just like to remind you all to click that like button wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube. Leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well and leave us a five star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. I know about Jacob's Run, you, you mentioned it before, but also how has it helped to run those 500 miles? Uh, uh, Camino was a San Diego, Santiago. Yes. Trail that you did. Now, was that recent? I got back. It was, yes, it was just recently. I think I've only been back for like maybe four weeks at the most at the most. So it was incredible. Um, it was from St. John, France into uh, Santiago, Spain. So it was a 500 mile trek of uh, walking every day for 33 days with an average of 15 miles a day. And the journey, it's interesting because, you know, like most things with my ADHD, uh, someone will say, hey, this sounds like fun. You want to do it? Sure, I'll do it. So I signed up for things not really knowing until a few months before when I started to really research it. And I realized, hey, this is this is supposed to be a spiritual experience. Most people come to do this pilgrimage because they're going through life changing. Something in their life is happening where they need to make a decision or we need to make a change, whether it's a loss of a loved one or a uh, divorce, or it could be anything, or a career change, or, or midlife crisis. It could be anything that these people are out there searching for an answer. And most of them are very religious. So I didn't know what I was getting into, but I thought, well, maybe I should have a question for myself and it'll be answered by the time, you know, the uh, truck is over. Uh, at that time, I Last year at this time, I rode my bicycle across the United States. It was so cool. It was really fun. But three days before it ender, ended, I was um, attacked by four dogs. I was bitten four times. This was in Florida. They tried to drag me off my bike. I don't know how I survived. I, I was able to get back onto the road because they ran me off the road. And a gentleman stopped and he saved my life. 
So I wanted those, I wanted something to be done. And I had to fight with this county of Florida for a full year and gather evidence before they actually did something. And so they came up with a dangerous dog ordinance because of all of the data that I had evidence that I had collected against this family and the dogs. Uh, but they never paid my medical bill. So I thought, should I still pursue it? It's not that much money, but it's more about the principle that they didn't take accountability. So I thought, well, that's a question that's going to be answered. But that's not what happened. I, you know, I'm Jewish and I went to this and I went to all of the, uh, a lot of the masses and a lot of the cathedrals, which I thought were amazing. But I was also approached like by a priest and by a nun who I felt this connection with. And they gave me these blessings and even a stranger who gave me a prayer. And I felt very touched by that. And I also met one person in particular. We just got to talking and we walked for a few days together. She lost a son four and a half years ago, who was nine years old, the same age as my grandson. And she was going through a really difficult time, you know, after just losing her son. It was very traumatic for her. He came home from school and died about an hour and a half later because of a brain aneurysm. So it was very unexpected. So we had a great connection. And that was something I wasn't expecting. Um, then I, you know, just I ran into another guy from um, Croatia who was there because he was gay and his partner and him couldn't really come out with their relationship because of where they live. So it was very traumatic for him. And the last night that I spent with him, we went out to dinner and I told him about my son and he started crying and held my hands. And he said, your son would be as old as I am right now. So we had that connection. So all these little things just kept adding up, which was just, it was an incredible trip. Wow, that sounds incredible. I, I mean, you couldn't think those things up. You know, you, it's no, no. way you known those things would happen. Incredible. Um, but you, you're obviously physical exercise for you. Obviously, is something that fuels you, and I would think your spirit as well. Um, but what, does that resonate with you? Am I, does that sound right? Yes. And I, you know, it's interesting because my husband, it's like yin and yang, <laughs> which is good because I can't imagine two of me <laughs> living in the same house. I just, you know, I'm very energetic and he will hike with me, but there's no way he would do something like that. He would hate it. And so while I was on this hike, I would see these beautiful ruins. And you can't see these places unless you're actually trekking it. You know, there's no other way to do it. And I would say, my husband's name is Bob. And I would say, Bob would love this. Bob would love this. And then five miles into it, Bob would hate this. Bob would hate this because it would get very difficult. Um, and other family members, I kept thinking, how can I take them on a journey like this? How can I have them experience but the reality of it is it's not for everybody, you know, so you have to experience it in a different way. So maybe fly to Europe and then do smaller, much smaller treks and, and do more about the sightseeing and things like that. So uh, but for me, I just I just really enjoy it. In fact, I'm leaving for Africa in August and I'm planning to uh, summit Kilimanjaro. So that'll be a big, big event for me. That is huge. Literally Kilimanjaro, but <laughs> just the, the, the prospect and the task. In yes. Itself. But that sounds exciting. So, and speaking of, sorry, go ahead. Yes. No, no, I was just going to say it's going to be much different. Um, this was a spiritual, I although I don't know, maybe event is a, each one. Well, each big event like that brings meaning to itself. And to me, another thing I just want to say is it, what I did realize meeting Glenda and meeting Jan and um, it, it's all about family for me. And, and when you think about it, when Jacob was passing, it was me again, wanting to help the families in the hospital. So there's this common denominator. And I came from such a horrific 
childhood that, you know, perhaps it was bringing families together and helping families that has been the drive in me and the athletic part of it. That's just helping with the ADHD, <laughs> calm me down. It's like a, it's like a sensory thing that I need, you know, a sensory diet for myself. And it's a way for me to stay. It's almost like a meditative state for me. Right. And in your work as well, I would think, though you've set up these challenges as such or these tasks, I don't know what word to use for it, but that's, those are the words that come to me at the moment. Your clients will do that as well, I suppose. How do they overcome their challenges? Uh, do they set tasks and follow them or seek to? So we do. So we, uh, when they come in, I'm very goal oriented, as you can tell. And so we set goals for them. What do you want from therapy? Because that's how we're going to set your goal. And I can help you reach that goal. But I need to know what it is you want. Do you want to be, you know, is it depression? Well, I write you a schedule. Once we get all the information together from the data sheets, I put together a comprehensive behavioral plan. And that entails a motivational story all about them a motivational story, uh, visuals to go around the house and specific things that they need to do and follow through with different strategies they need to practice. How do you change that behavior? Can we, I can help you get to your goal, but you have to follow what we're putting, what we're implementing. Right. Which brings me to your book, actually, because that will be an insight into exactly what you described. So you, your book, You're Not Crazy living with anxiety, obsessions, and fetishes. Tell us what inspired you to write the book and what can people find in the book? Well, what inspired me was I, so you, I get uh, referrals from pediatricians quite a bit. Um, they're worried about, you know, they're, they're, they're this child that comes in and the parent needs training. And I, I, but I was getting a lot of referrals from dermatologists for skin pickers. So that's an OCD behavior and it become disfiguring. And they, you know, uh, the doctor would say, well, there's really nothing uh, medically wrong with your skin. You have uh, some psychological disorder that's, that's having you pick your skin and disfigure yourself. So once the pediatricians and the dermatologists, they would say to me, you know, Lori, your methodology is very useful and it's helpful using these two, two modalities of cognitive behavioral therapy and behavioral therapy, you really should write a book. And so for years I thought, oh, write a book, write a book. But then when I turned 60, I thought, okay, here's another goal for myself. I'm 60 years old, I'm gonna write a book. And so that's what I did. And I explained a little bit in the beginning of the book of how I, I experienced panic attacks myself and what, what did I do to help myself get through that. And um, in the book, there's six different case studies that uh, social anxiety, obsessive compulsive behavior, um, uh, I, I can't remember what some, and fetishes. And then I think there's just generalized anxiety. And it talks, they are case studies, the names have been changed, but they're, you know, and the storyline just a bit, maybe male was female and so forth. Oh, and I also have one that's a conversion disorder, which I've only had, I think, three cases of conversion disorder. So instead of thinking you're having a heart attack, you actually think you're paralyzed or you have a seizure. So it's very, very interesting. So that case is in there as well. And it, the book will take you through these case studies and what it looked like when they came into my office and how they took data and what treatment plan was implemented with them and what was the outcome of therapy. So those are in there, but also in the back of the book, there's a, a toolkit. So the individual who buys the book will get the data sheets are in the book. They have visuals that are in the book. They will get, how do you write your own motivational story? It's step-by-step step and fill in the blank. So you can have your own plan within that book that you can write to, you write yourself. So yes, thank you for that. So I will put a link to the book, You're Not Crazy, Living with Anxiety, Obsessions and Fetishes. When I read, when I just read the title, I want, I think everybody has some obsessions, some anxiety. I don't know about fetishes though. 
<laughs> no, not everybody has fetishes. And some people need to, you know, uh, once I had one client in particular um, who had just moved out and his mother, I don't know what she thought, but I think she was in denial and that's fine. He's an adult now, but he was going to get kicked out of his apartment building because he couldn't tell anybody that he liked to wear women's clothing, but a certain, a certain texture of it. And that was part of his fetish. So he would wait in the laundry room of the apartment building and then steal clothes from the dryer of people. So he almost got kicked out. So once I got called in for something completely different, but once I started to collect data and, and then I realized, oh, this is, this is a fetish, you know? And so I explained to him, gave him the uh, description of what a fetish is. And I said, you're, you, you're not alone. You have other people that experience the same thing, but we need to figure out a way for you not to get arrested and not to get kicked out of your apartment building. It's okay if you go to the store and buy a piece of woman's clothing. Now you have to remember this was like 10 years ago, so it wasn't as open-minded, but he was so relieved that he could do this and it just opened up a whole new world for him. Incredible. And that is neat. That is a niche area of therapy, really. A lot of therapists don't, you know, focus on that. Maybe they do, but it's, I don't see it advertised. I don't see it. So when I saw it in your description, I thought, well, that's very interesting that you deal particularly with that. And one thing I wanted to mention, and just, I just thought of it and we were talking about kids and social media, um, Sometimes they'll come in and they've looked up a diagnosis already, uh, you know, uh, the definition on their phone, because you can pull up anything. But then it makes the um, anxiety even worse, because now they think they have a list of different diagnoses. And I say, stop, don't look up anything on your phone anymore. This is what we're going to do, because it just makes everything. Of course, like you said, we all have a little bit of everything. It's when it's goes too far to the other side, to the extreme, and we start exhibiting uh, inappropriate behaviors, then it, then we need help. Yes, and, and also, as you've described, when it becomes criminal, uh, when it becomes a threat to perhaps other people, you know, effectively taking other people's possessions, like the yeah. you gave, which is criminal. Oh. Yeah. Or losing losing your job, doing poorly, getting kicked out of school, or doing poorly in school, your interpersonal relationships, all these things are affected. That's why you came to see us, right? Exactly. And that, <laughs> which, you know, winds our interview down quite nicely, actually. If someone were feeling as though they weren't sure, they think, okay, I get I can't sleep. Is that normal? Is that or I'm I'm hair picking, um, or I'm biting my nails and they're bleeding, something. All of these things. If they think this could be an issue, what should they do? What's the first place to start? Where's the first place to start? Well, I always think, uh, when did this behavior start? Did it, st were you triggered by something or is it a bad habit that's just gotten completely out of control and you need to stop? So I think that's where the data part of it comes in because a lot of people that come to see me and you'll find this in the book even that they don't, they don't really, they don't think about when did it start? You know, sometimes it's very important and sometimes it's not as important at all. I don't like to dwell on the past so much, but we do need to figure out when did this actually start? So we can stop it and find out what triggers you because there's a trigger to the behavior. If we can find out what the trigger is and then come with a proactive approach to help you stop the behavior before it occurs, that's what's going to help you be successful. Yes, I, I and I don't know about you, but sometimes just that starting part with people, I find that they're so addicted to the anxiety around it it's difficult for them to settle down and think about these very important questions about when did it start, where did it start. I find the anxiety takes over. They just want it fixed now. <laughs> <laughs> they just want it done. And yes, getting them to think go away is so important. But Laurie, that's been fascinating. I mean, your practice is obviously thriving. So um, I'll put the links there. People watch from the U.S. is our second largest viewer. Uh, Spain as well is up there. But oh. it's 
UK, US, and Australia. So, um, so yes, yeah, so lots of people will see this for, in the US. And um, you do work online as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they don't have to come to Camar. Is it Camarillo? Camarillo. Nice. I don't live there. I live about 25 minutes away, closer to the ocean. But um, it's, I love Ventura County. Well, thank you so much. That's been excellent. Um, and go and get the book, guys. And also follow Lori on social media. The links will be there. I'm sure you wouldn't mind a question or two, you know, if you were thinking about something, just. Uh, oh, I know. I say, In fact, I say that in my book. You could, if you have a question, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer it. I do want to mention, too, you've been in a lot of media, Forbes magazine. You talked about online therapy and ADHD, and I think that's hugely important. And I like that you give people questions to ask as well about therapy when you go and see a therapist. That's hugely important. And the OCD part as well. But your website has a lot of information, too. So I would encourage people to go to your website as well. Can you tell us the website? Although I'll put the link. Just tell us what it is. The website for my practice is lauriesingerbehavioral.com. And that at the bottom, there'll be a link for the book as well. You're not crazy book.com. Well, that's another one. You're not. It, so you can go to either one and it will take you to the other site. I see. But, but it's probably easier, lauriesingerbehavioral.com. Okay, great. Either well, way. All those links will be up there. Thanks again, Lori. Take well, care. thank you for having me. It was very fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.